Praise God. Uh, we want to address a, a, a very important tom, uh, topic for us or subject for us as believers this morning. Uh, I really don't feel that we understand the very power that is within us and uh, the words that we speak, uh, how they impact others. Uh, it was very much intended by God that you and I would be able to impact others for his kingdom by the words that we speak. Okay, uh, And so this morning, I want to talk to you about one of the most powerful weapons uh, that we have available to each of us personally in this room. If you would go with me to Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8. Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8. Luke wrote Acts, he tells us in verse 8, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the utter, or to the end of the earth, uttermost parts of the earth. That's the King James. Hallelujah. Now, Amen. Whether you understand it or not, your witness is very, very powerful. Very powerful, all right? And uh, what it simply is going to do is going to give a record of what God has done to you uh, and through you. And this is what our world needs to hear this morning. What God has done for you. Uh, many people have heard stuff about the Bible. Okay? And to many of them, it's very abstract. It's very, uh, it's, just, it's just a book. But you and I are the shoe leather of that book. We are the, we're the mouth, we're the ears, we're the eyes of that book. Your testimony is very, very powerful, whether you realize it or not. And it was through the witness of his apostles and disciples that the entire world would be impacted. Okay. Uh, now, when we talk about a witness this morning, we're, we're not talking about inviting people to church, all right? It's good to invite people to church. But we're, we're talking about what God has done for you personally. We're not talking about arguing uh, doctrine because you will get people that will argue doctrine and, and things that you say will promote some to argue with you because they're just not going to agree with you. Uh, but what a witness does is he merely tells what he has seen and what he has heard, all right? In Acts chapter 2, verse 30, when the Apostle Paul was preaching, or Apostle Paul Peter was preaching, and he tells us, therefore, being a prophet, verse 30, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne, he, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. And then Peter says this, This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Now, just, just hang out with me. When you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you have received resurrection power. All right, That's what it is. It's, uh, we don't have time to go to Romans chapter 8 this morning, but that's what it is. And so you give testimony to the same resurrection, amen, that brought Jesus out of the tomb when you start speaking about how God has changed your life and risen you from the ashes of whatever you were involved in, amen. It, and it is vital for our world to hear that today. And Peter said, we are all witnesses, okay, of what God has done. Therefore, he says, verse 33, 
being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out the, this which you now see and hear. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The gospel must be seen and it must be heard, and the way it's going to be seen and heard is by you and by me. Y'all got a story. You may not think much of your story, but you have a story. You got a story of what God has done for you. Amen. Amen. And that is a it's a continuing story. Everybody say continuing. Amen. Salvation's just the beginning of the story. But what has God done for you since he filled you with the Holy Ghost? And how is he working in you now since he's filled you with the Holy Ghost? That is a testimony, and that is very powerful in our world today. Can you all say amen? Amen. amen. When, when Judas betrayed Jesus and, and they begin to look for someone else to, to be another apostle, the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 1 uh, that they needed somebody that was a witness. Beginning from the baptism of John, verse 22, to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. Amen. And so again, amen, they wanted people that heard and they wanted people that saw. Now you understand that this verse was written before the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. So that witness was going to begin to spread when they were experiencing the power of God's Spirit working through them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, the, the Bible tells us in, in Acts chapter 4 and verse, verse 33 that when they, when they begin to testify, of course, that created persecution. Uh, the, uh, the lame man at the gate being healed uh, begin to uh, impact the city of Jerusalem. And, of course, it also brought the rising up of uh, opposition and those that hated uh, Jesus Christ and hated what it stood for. And as they prayed, the Bible says in verse 33, and with great power, the apostles gave witness to what? To the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Well, you, you want to feel the resurrection power? Just start talking about what God has done for you to somebody that doesn't know God, to someone that's not experienced God. Just start talking about what God's done for you to somebody that doesn't know God, that has not experienced again, but there's still great power. Hallelujah in God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. And God wants to work through us. Amen. Do not minimize. Do not minimize your testimony. Let me round that by you again. Do not minimize your testimony. You will say, some of us will sit in this, in this congregation this morning and will say, well, that person's got a great testimony. That person's got a great testimony. You have a great testimony. Hallelujah. And God wants to use that. Amen. When you, do, when you speak to others, he wants you to declare the resurrection power. How? By you telling him what God has done for you. Hallelujah. And the Bible says great grace was upon all of them. I'm here to tell you the grace of God will be upon you. Do you remember what the scripture says where he told his disciples, you're not to spend your time trying to think of how you're going to present yourself to them. You just go and I will give you the words to speak. There's nothing wrong with, amen, sitting down and writing out your testimony and and, and cleaning it up so you're not going in all kinds of different directions. But every time you begin to declare the word of God, what God has done for you, the grace of God is going to be upon you. Hallelujah. And that grace is not just going to impact you, it's going to impact those that hear the words that you are speaking. Hallelujah. And any time you begin to declare how great God is and what God has done for you, there is going to be the power of God there. Hallelujah. It's not a question, will God show up? No, that's, that's not the issue at all this morning. When you declare the word of God, you would declare what God has done for you. God is going to show up. Hallelujah. 
He's going to show up. You know, you wonder why they get tears in their eyes. You wonder why they all of a sudden, you know, I mean, they, 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 their eyes have been wandering all over the place, and you can tell you really haven't had their attention. And when you begin to declare what God's got, all of a sudden they're riveted on you. What happened? God's grace, God's power brought attention to what was going on in your life, and they are listening and hearing Amen, about a God that still works today. Hallelujah. Can you all say praise God? God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now I'm trying to be calm here this morning, not be, uh, not get well worked up, you know. You know, you gotta, you gotta build up your working up when you got a larger congregation, you know, in the house. But, you know, it's, it's sort of hard to do. You start talking about Jesus. Amen. You just want to sort of get worked up and get a little excited and your voice rises and, you know, that's all what it's about. Hallelujah. I have, I have heard again and again the testimonies of Brother Major and Brother Nowak, amen, as they as sat in with, with me in, in Bible studies in the House of Corrections and other, other venues that we have done that, amen. And invariably they, they hear, it gets their attention, amen. It draws people, amen, to what's being spoken. Praise God. Hallelujah. We all like to hear somebody else's story, don't we? Amen. Amen. And and they also want to hear what God has done for us. Praise God. (laughs) Hallelujah. Now, in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 8, when God uh, sends Moses down to Canaan, he, he gives him a word. And this word is emphasized by the very burning bush itself. And so God says to Moses, so I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from a land to a good large land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Okay. Now, I wasn't there when it was presented to Moses. But it, it, it must have been very startling. Here's a man that is, uh, Stephen will say that he did great, great exploits himself when he was in Egypt. Uh, uh, history, ancient history says that Moses was a general, actually won victory for Egypt, actually saved them from defeat in a battle. Uh And so this is a man that when he hears these statements that God makes, he's not naive. In fact, he has fled as far from Egypt as he can get. Amen. He knows Egypt's power. He knows what Egypt presents to any any people. Uh, He also knows the difficulty that the children of Israel are in. He's had 40 years to think about it. And don't you for a moment think that he got down to Midian and got down there with his father-in-law Jethro and that all he dismissed everything that took place in Egypt? He did not. He's just like the rest of us. When we have things happen in our life, we don't forget. And it is an impactful of events that he had gone through. He had not forgotten, all right? But what turned this man around was the very word of the Lord. Hallelujah. You see, God's word is powerful, all right? Hallelujah. Flesh is weak. Everybody say flesh is weak. Amen. Flesh will always be ready to debate you, to tell you why it can't happen. Amen. To dismiss anything that's going on because it is weak. But the word of God is powerful. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's powerful. Praise God. So now when they, they get out of, Can- uh, out of Egypt and they're in the wilderness and, and they've been to Mount Sinai and they're now on their way into Canaan and they've got as far as Kadesh Barnea. The Bible says they were just 11 days journey from Canaan. And uh, the Bible lets us know that they sent out 12 spies. We all know the story. They sent out 12 spies. Okay. Uh, we're not going to go into it, but if you were to go into Deuteronomy, you will see that 
The sending of the 12 spies actually did not originate with God, but actually originated with the children of Israel themselves. All right? And the reason it originated there is because flesh is weak. And, and just let me, just, I know you'll not, you'll not see verse 8 of Exodus 3 repeated again in the scripture in its context. You won't see it. Okay. And, and here's, here's my personal feeling. Um, they, they didn't, Israel didn't keep repeating that. He brought us out to bring us up. We're going to land flowing with milk and honey. Okay. They, they, they didn't, they didn't go over that again. They didn't get it into their spirit. All right. Have you ever dealt with people, man? They just, they look at everything in a negative way. You know, that's because their spirit's been affected by whatever they choose to allow it to be affected by. And the only way to change it is to get God's positive, powerful word into your heart, to your life. And so they're out there, and amen, and they, and they're, they, they know that there's a land they're supposed to be going to, and it's a land flowing with milk and honey, but they just, I don't think they're, 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 they're putting it to practice in, in their thoughts and the, and in how they act. They're just, they're following the cloud and they're following the fire and, and, and they begin to dismiss the power of God. All right? Oh, okay, I, I got to be careful I don't bleed over into this morning into another thing. And, uh, and, and we can do the same thing. It, it becomes so easy for us to be around God's presence. What we experience, you know, the majority of our world does not experience they walk in here and they sense God. And for many of them, it's the first time that they've ever really sensed God or they became aware that it was God that was dealing with them. And they really don't know how to handle it and take it. Praise God. And, amen, if our flesh is dictating to us how we're going to approach them, what we're going to say, we are not going to encourage them Amen. And on that journey to follow Jesus Christ. Okay. And so here's the children of Israel. They're, they're at Canaan's Barnea. They've sent the 12 spies. The 12 spies come back. Amen. And the Bible tells us in Numbers chapter 13 and 23 that they had come back from the Valley of Eshkel, which they had cut down a branch with a cluster of grapes. They not only had grapes, they had, uh, they had pomegranates and they had figs. And they had the evidence of the fruit of that land. Hallelujah. Now that's what they should have focused on. They should have focused on the fact that there's two guys that are walking into the camp with, with a pole between their, uh, you know, on their shoulders, and they got this humongous cluster of grapes on there. That's what they should have focused on. But they did not. Everybody say they did not. Let, let me just point out something to you. In our walk with God, you cannot spend your time focusing on negative things. All right? Now, are negative things going to take place? Absolutely. They're going to happen. The only reason you would bring up any kind of negative is to glorify God by the positive of what God is doing in that situation. All right? That's what you got to do. We'll go crazy. We'll go crazy this morning, ladies and gentlemen, if we all we ever focus on is all the bad things that ever happened to us in this on this planet. And, and when you and when you're dealing with somebody, your your personal testimony may have uh, uh, some negative in it as you talk about some things that have taken, but you've always got to swing it over to glorify and uh, uh, uphold God and, and show God's greatness in it, all right? But here's what happens to the children of Israel, okay? So they, they had cut down these, uh, these grapes and they had brought them back. And verse 27, uh, when they came back, to the people, they said they told them, We went to the land where you sent us. Truly, they said, it flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Hallelujah. Then they said, 
Verse 31, after he said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And the Bible says in verse 32 that they gave the children of Israel a bad report. They focused their testimony on the wrong view. When you're dealing with something in your life and you begin to declare to somebody else what you're dealing with, you must take whatever you're dealing with and focus it on the proper view. Hallelujah. You know what? All of us got a bad story. And you know, we can really get worked up about our bad story today. We really could. That we could just we could just have fun in here this morning talking about our bad stories. And and in if if I told a bad story, then Brother Leo come along and he tells his bad story, then Brother Brian and we get around here and 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 you'll know something about a bad story. They always get bigger. Because I gotta beat your fish story. <laughs> I gotta make you see that I suffered more than you suffered. And so in our testimony, yes, you may bring out negative things in the testimony. But amen, but you've got the evidence of what God's word said between, amen, two people. Those are a bunch of grapes, and that's what you focus on. God's word is true. God was there with me in my valley. God was there with me when I was facing giants. God was there with me. Amen. I got the evidence of mean, what God has done. Other things take place. Oh, yes, they took place. But God is able to deliver me and able to deliver you. Oh, my God. I think, I think if we were to work on never saying anything negative, it would tremendously limit our speech. In fact... I, I told Lord God, I don't want to offend anybody today. Help me to be nice. For some, they may not be able to talk at all. <laughs> Praise God. And so, the world needs my testimony. And it may have some negative in it, but I'm not going to major on that minor. I'm going to focus on what God has done. Hallelujah. Brother Bryant, you went through cancer. I mean, you could just focus on how nasty cancer is and all the things it did to your body and, and what, how it beat you down. But you could do that or you could say, you know what, I had cancer. It was a pleasant experience. But I got this great God that saw me through my cancer. I got this great God that came and delivered me Amen. When I was alone in that bed and I was wondering if I was going to live, God visited me. You see that? You know, yes, so you may have a negative, but you, you don't let the negative be the major thing in your testimony. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, Mark 16 and 15, and, and I'm just, I'm not telling you stuff you don't already know. Mark 16 and 15, and he said, uh, to them, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. And he who believes in his baptism, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they'll cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and they, if they drink any deadly thing, it will I mean, no, no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up to heaven, Amen. And this is sat down at the right hand of God. So what did they do? Verse 20. And they went out, preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word that a, through accompanying signs. Now, hear me. Okay. You hear what it just said? Confirming the word through accompanying signs. Well, what were these signs that were confirmed, which confirmed the word of God? Casting out devils, speaking with new tongues, and if they drink up, if they take up serpents, if they drink any deadly thing, just let me pause and say something there. Amen. Again, Jesus spoke 
many times. Uh, he spoke of the Holy Ghost as water. I don't believe he's literally talking here about serpents, although it's the same word that's used for a snake. Uh, you know, I don't think he's talking about here about us going out and drinking poison. But, but understand the day that they lived in. You see, false doctrine is destructive. All right, it's destructive. Uh, if you take that up, it can destroy you if you're not careful. All right, and and, and it, how does it destroy? It becomes eternally, internally a part of us. Okay, with me. The false doctrine they were dealing with was now, amen. One at one time had been what they'd all been a part of. It was Judaism. Who opposed them more than anybody else? The other Jews that continued to follow the Old Testament practices of going to the temple, amen, taking a lamb and offering it to God there, amen. And now that had all been fulfilled. So they were going to confront continually, amen, a false doctrine, amen, a doctrine that was no longer uh, vibrant for the, for the people of God, amen. It, it, it was now a, you understand what I'm saying? What, what is it? Why did the Jews chase uh, Paul all over Europe? And because he was preaching Jesus, and they still wanted to stay in the Old Testament. Amen. So there are things that we're going to confront. There's false doctrines. But the Word of God says that they're not going to hurt us. Amen. Hallelujah. So in, when we give our testimony, when we declare our testimony, we need to expect... That, amen, demons are going to get cast out. We need to expect that people are going to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. We need to expect that we're going to pray for the sick and they're going to recover. Because that's the confirming sign of his word. And that is the power of your testimony. Hallelujah. It's not just, he's just not talking about his apostles here. He's talking about every believer. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you have the right to pray for somebody? Of course you do. Do you have the right to believe God? Of course you do. The gospel of Jesus Christ has been so perverted today and so diluted that it absolutely has no effects in the majority of Christianity. In fact, the majority of Christianity just buys into whatever science or the, or the current philosophies are, or the current ethos. The current ethos is same-sex marriage. So, so what is main, mainline Christianity doing? It, it's figuring out a way to accept it, amen, and make themselves, because they sure don't want to be labeled as some kind of fanatical group of people. And that's... You know what Paul said? He says, I am of the way called heresy. Do you know what they labeled the Christians? They're a bunch of fanatics. They're a bunch of... Do you know some of the things they said about them? When they started talking about the, the, you know, the, the communion, there, there's some very negative things that were spoken in that area. D did you know that? We're not here to win a popularity contest. I am not here to, to have my society accept me and put their stamp of approval on them. The moment I declare the word of God without, without uh, you, know, you know, put my uh, sprinkle on it so it, it's platable, is the moment that I get moved to the outside. And they, and they want to disregard us. You, you understand? If you don't understand that, just go talk to many people that claim to be Christian today and just simply read to them what the Word of God says. That's what you have to do. You don't, you don't have to put your, you know, it's in there. you don't have to put any kind of commentary to it at all. We, but we got a testimony, ladies and gentlemen. Trying to fit into this world is not going to change people's lives. Trying to be like everybody else is not going to do it. You have a testimony of God's power, amen, and God will confirm the word when you declare it and speak it. Hallelujah. Uh, 
I just sensed in this room right now that people would say, yeah, but, 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 but. Uh, I've done it. Nothing happened. Uh, the what ifs. Well, if I put myself there and present what God has done, what if he doesn't show up? That's human flesh at work. That's a rationalization that does not come from heaven. God will work. What we have to dismiss from our mind is the same thing the Israelites should have dismissed from their mind when, when they're coming and they're hearing the words of these men saying there are walled cities and there's giants and begin to list the, the annex are there and, and, and can't. And you know what? It doesn't matter. Let me ask you a question. Did they take the land? And the answer to that is, yes, they did. I don't care how many giants were there. They took the land. I don't care how many walled cities were there. They still took the land. But you see, we have been so integrated into our society that whether we realize it or not, we are filled with unbelief. And God, forgive me of my unbelief. Amen. I need to stand on what God says. And if he says we're supposed to do this, then we need to do it. Amen. And if he says signs are going to follow, then the signs are going to follow. Hallelujah. 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 I always like to look and see, amen, how the disciples reacted to Jesus. In John chapter 1, verse 35, uh, John has just announced that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God. Two of his disciples, Andrew and John, are there, and they... Uh, they begin to follow Jesus. And Jesus turned and seeing these two guys said, What do you seek? And they said, Rabbi, uh, where are you staying? We'd like to spend some time with you. And he said to them, Come and see. Come and see. But does God work at your church? Do people still get the Holy Ghost at your church? People get their sins washed? Do people get healed at your church? Do miracles happen at your church? Same answer. Come and see. We don't have to force anything, ladies and gentlemen. God wants to work amongst us. Hallelujah. Just come and see. It so impacted John and Andrew that they spent the entire day with Jesus. Not only did it impact them, but when they got away from Jesus, amen, immediately the Bible says in verse 41 that uh, Andrew found his brother Simon, and the first thing he says to his brother is, we have found the Christ. Hallelujah. 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 Do you remember how it was when you first got the Holy Ghost? You had the same spirit Andrew had. We have found the Christ. I mean, you start talking about getting baptized in Jesus' name and speaking in tongues, and the people you're talking had no clue what you were talking about. What you are literally saying to them is, come and see. Come and see. You can experience what I have experienced. You can know God as I have come to know God. You know, it's the same thing that the Samaritan women, woman said, amen, to that village in Samaria after she had sat there and listened to Jesus, and amen, and he had explained to her some things, and and uh, it says here in, in, in the John chapter 4, uh, she said in verse 29, she said, Come see a man, hallelujah, who told me all things that I ever did. That's your testimony. I, I went to see, and I came away believing, and he worked in my life. Hallelujah. And if he worked in my life, he can work in your life. You see, that's what a testimony is all about. Do you know what happened when she went She went to the men of the village, all right? By the time she got done telling them what Jesus had said to her and how she felt about it, they all went out to see him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the Bible says in verse 39, and many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all that I ever did. Don't tell me 
Your testimony can't impact people. Hers impacted an entire village. The only way your testimony will not impact anybody is by not speaking it. That's the only way. That is the only way. So what does the devil want you to do? Absolutely. Keep quiet. Don't say anything. Hallelujah. Don't say anything. Don't talk about it. Now, that, that, that's, that's personal. We don't talk about, you know, you ever run across those people? You start talking about God. Oh, that's personal. Personal? I'm glad it's personal. Do you know him? If it's personal, do you know him? Amen. Amen. Praise God. It is a wonderful thing. When you hear words like Philip heard when he was at the wor- was worshiping in Jerusalem at the feast, and Greeks who came, probably proselytized Greeks, came to him. And, and, and perhaps they came to Philip because his name is, is a Grecian name. And they said, sir, we wish to see Jesus. My God. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Isn't that what we want them to say? Sir, I am. We wish to see this Jesus that you're talking about. We wish to know, can he work in our life like he's worked in yours? Hallelujah. The power, oh my, the power of your personal testimony. I got I to gotta close it down. Let me just quickly, I'm going to go to Acts chapter 22 and verse 2. In building your testimony, all right, in building your testimony, you need to tell people a little bit about yourself, all right? Acts 22, 3. Paul says, I indeed, a Jew born in Tarsus of Sicilia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law. And he goes on and even he gets even into the, the aspects of persecuting those of the way and binding and delivering uh, people into prison. You you gotta tell him what you've been, all right? Now you don't have to go into lengthy detail. Don't, don't, don't glorify your sinful actions. All right, don't glorify them. Just, just, just give the detail. I was ignorant slob. No. <laughs> and, and so he, he says, he tells him what he had been, what he was. And then, go down to verse 22, 6. He begins to explain what happened to him. So you tell him what you've been. And you tell him, what happened to you, all right? <laughs> I was on my way to Damascus about noon, and, and he's telling this to the Jewish leadership, okay? Suddenly a great light from heaven shone around about me. And I fell to the ground, and a voice spoke to me saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And so I answered, who are you, Jesus? Or who are you, Lord, excuse me? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuted. Do you understand his audience? These, many of these folks have been involved in crucifying Jesus. Do you understand what he is saying to them? But he's just explaining his experience. You see, if you want to, you can get into debate with people, but how do they debate your experience? Oh, that didn't really happen to you. No, it didn't. You didn't speak in tongues. And so he told them, what. you know what he also did? He also told about Ananias coming to him, and he goes down here to verse 16, and he said, uh, and now why are you waiting? Rise and be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So he he tells them what changed him. When you're giving your personal testimony, you don't have to use a ton of scriptures. You just simply tell them, that I was filled with the Holy Ghost, and when I was filled with the Holy Ghost, I began to speak with tongues. You know, you, you don't have to go in well in Acts chapter 2, or, you know, or Acts 8, or Acts 10, or Acts... No, you just tell them what God did for you. You tell them how you felt. You tell them how maybe strange it was to be speaking in tongues. I mean, it was you, and you say, wow. You tell them how it was when you went down in water and came out of water hearing the name of Jesus baptized. Do you know a lot of people in our world don't even know how they were baptized? Do you remember how you were baptized? 
Do you remember that day? You just simply, you don't have to use a lot of scripture. Amen. What you're doing is you're actually inserting do doctrine into your testimony. Amen. Sitting and verifying it, uh, verifying it with the word of God. You're just telling what happened. And that's what we're to do. And then, and then uh, now, now he had their attention. And then he began to explain where he was now, which is where you need to, you know, you, so I tell him where I was, how I changed, and what, what's going on now. I'm walking with Jesus. I pray. He answered my prayers. He's with me when I'm down. He's with me when things are okay. And, uh, but uh, when Peter begins, or when Paul begins to speak here, he talk about praying in the temple at a trance, and, and uh, he talks about the Lord telling him to get out of Jerusalem. And uh, so I said to the Lord, he says in verse 19, they know that in every synagogue I am in prison and beat those who believe on you. They know these things. And they know I was there with, with Stephen was martyred, was given consenting to his death. Okay, and then they've all listened up to now. And then he says in verse 21, he's talking about now. Then he said to me, and God said to him, the Lord said to him, depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. They don't want to listen to that. If you read the scripture in Acts 22, you'll see immediately there was quite a fervor that took place. All God wants us to do, ladies and gentlemen, is just declare our testimony. That's all he wants. He will confirm the words with signs. Hallelujah. You're not there to argue with them. You're, not, you're just there to, you see, this is about salvation. It's about entering the kingdom of God. This is not about how smart you are, how much of the Bible you know, or how many kings are in Judah, or, or how many kings are in Israel, or, or about the end of time. It's not about that. It's about what God has done for you personally. Hallelujah. Let's stand this morning. You have something powerful. You got something powerful. You got something of great value in your life. Great value. Hallelujah. Just declare what God has done for you. Declare it. Speak it to others. Hallelujah. Speak it to others. Turn to your neighbor and say, speak it to others. Speak it to others. Hallelujah. Just declare it. Hallelujah. Let's just lift our hands and praise him as we close this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the testimony of your people in this place. Thank you for what you've done in their lives. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Every believer in this house has a testimony of what God has done for them. And people need to hear that testimony. They need to hear what God has done. Hallelujah. And God is going to confirm that testimony with words. Signs follow. Hallelujah. You'll see the Spirit of God move upon them. And that's the time to talk to them about repentance. When you see the Spirit of God moving, on, that's the time. Don't wait to a church service. When you see tears in their eyes, don't wait. That's the time to talk to them about repenting of their sin. Hallelujah. Following Jesus. Hallelujah. Strike while the iron's hot. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Glory to God. Glory to God. God bless you this morning. Hallelujah. Y'all got a testimony. Powerful.